beginners to stage, beginners to stage. Hello everybody and welcome to this week's episode of Backstage at Cry Havoc. I am your host, Lori Ann Davis, she, her, and today I am talking to some more writers, well, the same writer and a different writer, David K. Barnes and Grace Knight, and we're going to be discussing the skill of writing real people, but in a fictional way. I haven't quite worked out how to word that well yet. Maybe by the end of the episode, I'll get there. Uh, But for now, please, can you introduce yourselves with your pronouns and a little bit about yourself and how you're involved with the project? Let's go alphabetically this time. David. Hello, I'm David K. Barnes. I he him and I am the creator and lead writer on Cry Havoc. Ask questions later. I really enjoy how slowly that went. (laughs) And Grace. Hello, I am Grace Knight. I'm one of the writers on Cry Havoc. I wrote episodes 17 and 18, and my pronouns are she, her. Lovely. And actually, let's get straight into it. In this episode, we're going to be talking about episode 17, To Summon a Queen, because it's coming out before episode 18, so we're going to try and avoid spoilers for episode 18. Can we start with a brief description of what happens in To Summon a Queen? This is the episode where Gaius, having captured the would-be assassin Charmian, has realised he has, potentially has Cleopatra over a barrel and so summons um, her to a kind of uh, mock trial um, to try and force various sort of uh, treaty-related sort of agreements out of her. And it it doesn't really work very well at all. Uh, Meanwhile, Octavia goes to visit Charmian in the prison to say, like, what the hell? What's what's going on, mate? And um, that's really sad as well. So it's 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 a lot of sadness, but also some oh. really nice jokes of Lepidus in there. <laughs> Lepidus making everything okay. <laughs> Grace, do you agree? Do you concur? I don't really think of it as a sad episode. I think because I just spend so much time when I'm writing this one just with the words japes, japes, japes going around yeah. in my head. That I just like <laughs> you know, just don't don't engage too closely with what's actually happening in this story. <laughs> Absolutely. I think we're entering the period of the series where objectively there's probably sort of sadness and, and anguish, but actually as writers we are oh no, we're very comfortable of that. That's hilarious. And so it's yeah. actually there's lots of good <laughs> and that very much carries on into into the, the next episode as well. Where things things are getting pretty dark from here on out, but you know, oh the japes. Yeah, the Japes. absolutely. Yeah, <laughs> just uh, what you do is you just sort of switch off your heart and uh, you just <laughs> oh, no. pretend you're writing like a really tonally inappropriate PG Woodhouse novel. Yeah, yeah. Uh. Oh, well, that's all I need to know about your method. So let's wrap the episode there. <laughs> Great, no. thank you. I'm going to rewind us a, a tiny bit. I just want to get some context on on you, Grace. Grace and David, have you worked together before? No. Not. Grace is a writer I'd not met before doing this series, but when we were uh, looking around for Writers Writers Room, um, Rusty Quill supplied us with various writers and um, samples of writing and, and things, and I really liked Grace's writing. I thought I'd like Grace to be on the series. If, she, if she'd like to be on this series, she actually did. That was it dead handy. Definitely. And so I met, I met Grace through that. And then um, during the earlier calls, turned out Grace also, I think you already had a, either you had a great interest in Rome already or you quickly developed a great interest in Rome and chowed <laughs> into this. But that's also dead handy. Oh, a bit of both. My sort of interest in classics. When I was at university, they were like really, you know, pro the indecisive. So they let you do like three subjects in the first year. So I did classics as one of those and instantly forgot everything. And then when I was an English teacher, I was working at this sort of inner city community college. They were like, okay, we really need someone to teach classics and you teach a subject that also involves reading so do you want to teach classics <laughs> and I was like well I'm wildly underqualified for this but sure so um I sort of briefly became an expert in very specific things that were on the syllabus so like I remember one summer holiday spending literally every day at the library learning about Socrates only it turns out if you cram like that you become very briefly an expert and then immediately forget yeah, absolutely, absolutely everything which incidentally is why I don't know anything about the late Roman Republic anymore <laughs> yeah yeah that's fair. But God knows I knew a lot about it briefly for a while there. I do remember, so Grace and I uh, knew each other before she wrote for Cry Havoc. And I do remember you being very excited telling me about the forgotten triumvirate. Oh, 
Lepidus and how everyone just keeps forgetting. Yeah. <laughs> when we were sort of asking the writers which bits are you interested in, a lot of the writers quite sort of gravitated towards the theatre subplot and and the sort of theatre japes, and uh, and then sort of, you know Grace said, I, I, yeah, I mean, that's great and all, but I really all, I want to know more about Mark and Gaius and Lepidus and the triumvirate and all the politics. And the politics? Yes, I've forgotten that. Yes, <laughs> this is what the series is meant to be about. Yes, brilliant, fantastic. So very much yeah. worked to Grace quite closely on that that final section, sort of like building things up. And, exactly. I think it's the, literally the only time in my entire life where I've been like, I want to write about the men, please. Uh, just yeah. all the men. <laughs> like, literally everything else I've ever written, I'm just like, yeah, but could it be a girl, though? Yeah. And this yeah. one, I'm just like, <laughs> yeah, yeah just, just want to write about some cross men arguing. It, it's the difficult thing about... I like... You know, I love... Rome art to write about Rome but when it comes to then sort of dramatising anything you go yeah it's a bunch of blokes though isn't it yeah, um, sure so, is. but this this is one of the the few sort of areas of, of Roman history where it, it, it's much simpler to get some really good female roles in mm-hmm. and non-male roles because um, you know, brilliant Cleopatra I mean historically Cleopatra wasn't in Rome at this this time I don't care I thought I want her there so <laughs> Cleopatra's here and we've got Fulvia and Octavia and we can do all that and that's mm. really great but mm. if you if this has been set even like you know ten years before it, it be just a bunch of blokes and a bit of argy bargy just know. a bunch of blokes and lads. yeah exactly it isn't easy when you're writing something set at that point in history like you say to manage to introduce interesting female characters and especially because we're talking about writing about real people part of the fun and part of the draw of the series i think is seeing these characters that are famous and that are historical dramatized and i think there's an imbalance there if all of the famous characters are the men and all of the characters you've kind of invented are the women because yeah. I think that part of the kind of attractiveness of the show only applies to about 50% of your cast so I think what David did really really well is find a period of history and also sort of jiggle the history you know to, to a <laughs> lesser or mostly greater extent to kind of put in a few people like Cleopatra but also to do things like making Octavia and Fulvia who were there and are like you know were part of it and were important and we know Fulvia did some like wild stuff later on so she's definitely a very interesting political actor making sure that they are important characters so we get to kind of reclaim a little bit from 2000 years of largely ignoring what the women did yeah (laughs) Yeah. so there are two avenues that I'm kind of torn between going down so I'm going to throw out both questions and see where we go one is what was it that made you want to write these three men grace since it is so against what you would normally go towards <laughs> and the other is did you feel a responsibility to these people who lived and existed to not misrepresent them okay hmm. so the reason i was so attracted to the triumvirate is partly because david has just picked such a fun setup you've got mark anthony who's this like posh boy pretending to be a bit of a lad you know soldier boy not really like politically savvy but like has like ace social skills and then you've got Gaius who is we know what he becomes right which is I suspect like for sure just a stone-cold psychopath but also like a political genius and he is really the opposite of Mark he is so like so smart and so like good at kind of administration and details but he can't play a crowd at all you know he can't deliver a speech he can't even stay in the same room with someone for more than 10 minutes without them wanting to throttle him you know, he's <laughs> like so annoying and I just find that kind of mixture of these two figures really interesting and then oh my heart we bring in the third <laughs> triumvir <laughs> Lepidus who is just literally if you look up the second triumvirate of Rome and do a cursory sort of skim of whatever you find I reckon you'll maybe see the word Lepidus once or twice in the last couple of paragraphs like people genuinely (laughs) they sort of think you won't notice that it is try like three he's just he's just you know the absolute definition of also there (laughs) (laughs) have you I don't suppose you would have heard any of Andy Seacombe's performance of Lepidus yet no I am really excited excited. yeah I'm really excited for you to hear it he is oh my goodness he's fantastic a joy yeah oh amazing I find it just really fascinating that you've got someone who will be we know he will be 
a terrifying tyrant who also turns the Roman Empire into the thing we think the Roman Empire is, but who right now is a little twerp who annoys everyone. And we've got this person who is this unbelievably powerful presence who's very good at working a crowd, but incapable of forward planning even to the end of the next drink, let alone to the end of like the Mm. next day and a half. And then you've also got this other bloke who just like hasn't really got it. And so I think there's a really interesting thing there that you can have these two people who do both understand what's going on and understand each other's strengths and weaknesses and are not really on the same team. And then you've got someone who's slightly behind the audience all the time. So the audience gets to really kind of enjoy the pleasure of being like, oh, Lepidus. But also, it also does mean you don't lose your audience because you do have someone who is going to require a little bit more explanation. I think something that's very, very tricky uh, with anything that's kind of like really quite complicated and set in quite an unfamiliar setting is making sure you don't just like confuse the hell out of everyone. I have said several times through this, I am the audience member who knows pretty much nothing about Rome, really. I, I'm learning through this experience. So yeah, and you didn't lose me. So that's good. Yay! <laughs> I understood. You, you succeeded. <laughs> so I think that's, that's what attracted me to it. And also, I think... It's such a just massive, monumental moment of history. So it's it's a period of history that, I mean, I I have now forgotten most of the details, but I'm very, very <laughs> interested in um, Cicero. And when I say very interested, I mean I've read two excellent novels about him and they were very good and I remember some of it. <laughs> so I am sort of fairly, like, a bit familiar with the late Republic. But the thing is, I just find that period of history, like... <sighs> Okay, so so during the late Republic, right, women had comparatively more freedom than they had really for most of human history before or subsequently. I mean, they didn't get to vote and stuff, but like, you know, there are points where laws are made and the women kind of turned out and protested and made a fuss and the, the laws got changed. The divorce laws were like a little bit more kind of kind towards women as well. And obviously some of the people got a vote. And then what we see in this this tiny moment of history, this one man, Right, Gaius Octavian, at that one moment, the perfect person in the perfect place, or depending on your point of view, absolutely the worst person in the worst yeah. place, he turns it around and he takes it out from under people's feet and no one notices until it's too mm. late and it's gone. It's the difficult point in when you're presenting a real person, especially in what is, you know, sort of a, a dark comedy. And I did think uh, quite a while about uh, Gaius, who I know grows up to be first emperor of Rome, and as Grace said, takes something which is, you know, it's not a great democracy, but it's, it's in fact, it's not really, it's still very much, you know, the, the powerful leading the powerful, but it, it's certainly not rulership by, by one person. And does manage to single-handedly establish what is the Roman imperial period that lasts for several hundred years and he does it with everyone agreeing that's a wonderful idea and not really quite understanding what's actually happening and he does it through political skill and lots of things but he is you know he's a sort of person you go you know my god how, how do you do that but also my god you're you're kind of a monster how do you make that the protagonist uh, the comic protagonist of a comedy program and I spent a while going is that even you know ethically sound <laughs> to do but I don't know. The, the thing is, I think there's something quite interesting in taking a character and fully understanding what they're doing, their point of view and all their frustrations. And then at some point, the exact moment where they cross over from being somebody that you might yourself empathize with to somebody you go, oh, no, oh, no, no. And you don't know quite where that moment is. I find very interesting. And I think yeah. that's actually, as I said, with various bits of the UK legislation, sometimes the really bad things do happen rather casually and almost sort of in the background. They're not always things, you know, where everyone notices and there's a huge debate happens. Sometimes they just happen. And that's the frightening bit. That's when, and and sometimes that's even around that sort of area. That's where a character like Lepidus sort of, who can be a very much bumbling comic character throughout a lot of uh, the series. But equally, from a certain perspective, is one of the only people who might be able to prevent sort of difficult things from happening. And presumably we go, you're, you're really not equipped to deal with this sort of thing. Mm-hmm. And so, and the reason why terrible things happen is if there are a lot of people who go, oh, you know what you're doing, and sit back and do nothing and don't, don't yeah. involve themselves. So it's, it's a really interesting, I, I, again, for me, it's 
I thought coming into the series, I thought I would sort of almost empathise more with, with guys and find him the easy one to write for because as part of it was my own frustrations in working on projects and various things over the years where I've always been the sort of like control freak character going, but that's going to go wrong, we're up this, this and this. And other, you know, somebody else in working because oh no, it would all be fine, all be fine. Just you, know, you, you worry too much. I think six months down the line, oh no, it's all gone wrong. I told you it would go wrong. Why didn't you listen to it? And so I thought that's the character, this sort of frustrated person who ends up going off the deep end because they get so wound up by various people they're working with. And I thought I'd empathise with that. And actually, as it went on, I realised because I saw a lot of myself in him, I sort of I ended up sort of having more sympathy for Mark Antony, who just wants to have a quite nice, enjoyable life. Where he probably <laughs> wants to just hang around a swimming pool and... He wants to have cocktails out of a pineapple with a straw. Like, that's what he wants. And I kind of sympathise and empathise with that sort of position. And, and that's it. I think I, I've always found it really hard to write villains. Like I'm doing a, a, a Doctor Who at the moment for Big Finish, actually adapting an existing story from the 80s. And it has this... Uh, but it's essentially just a villain. There's no motivation there beyond I am a villain. And so I'm trying to change that and do bits. But I do find a character who's designated the villain to be hard to write for because I, I'm a villain. I want to do a horribly evil things I, I can't get into that mindset I don't enjoy it so I always gravitate to the hero or I try to make sure every character is somebody that I could ostensibly agree with to some yeah, degree yeah it's, it's, it's an old adage that everyone is the hero of their own story right? yeah, yeah and it's, Absolutely, and it's yeah. true Gaius is 100% the hero of his story yeah. he's been given a system that doesn't work incompetent collaborators and <laughs> finally he's like okay I I, the person who actually have the relevant skills, am in a position to do the thing that it needs to be done, to do all yeah. the things that need to be done. And that is all also true. But unfortunately, he has, like, terrible ideas <laughs> and the skill to implement yeah. them. And that's it. I think um, Harry's performance as Gaius also... There's always a, a slight element in Harry's performance of... <sighs> I'm just trying to make this work. And so yeah. he, he becomes a character he's very easy to empathise with. He sounds like somebody you just want to like take away for a drink and go, it'll be all right, mate, come on, let, what can we do? There, there's something very winning about Harry's performance throughout this series, which contrasts very well with Kazim, giving it all the bluster as Mark Antony. Even Kazim, there are times when he's more like, I, I, you, know, he, he, you know, this far and no further. He has a moral backbone somewhere, but he's generally the, the relaxed one. Harry sounds always very put upon, and then Andy Seacombe is sort of just having a lovely time in the background. And then taken as a whole, that's a very fun dynamic to write with for comedy. Yeah. But also you can understand why the politics are going to spiral out of control. Mm. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Because the thing is, I think ultimately we're writing you know, a dramatic comedy, I think is how I saw you put it, David, yeah. when I was actually cribbing from your website from my website and I need to write out some <laughs> um, And I was like... Yeah, that's that's exactly what it is. And and the thing is, I think it's really important to have enough respect for your audience that like you can put all the dark stuff in, but basically it's tone and depth. Yeah. Fundamentally, this is a light listen and it should be just like fun and yeah. enjoyable and like japes yeah. and you know, full of stupid jokes about dried apricots. And yeah. it shouldn't yeah. be at its <sighs> The thing is, I think for me the, the genre that interests me the most, and it's not really a genre, which is sort of the point, is anything that sits right on the boundary between comedy and drama. Because yeah. I think you can pull the rug out from underneath someone much more effectively if you suddenly switch between those two. So if something's yeah. basically like a, a light comedy, and then suddenly you're like, uh-oh, this is really dark, that is going to hurt so much more than like yes. anything that comes in the like in the 45th minute of a drama yeah and similarly you never laugh so hard at anything as you do as something that comes after 20 minutes of like drama yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, obviously it's supposed to be funny <laughs> you know just because <laughs> there's like there's this this kind of cathartic release and the reason i think it's so interesting as a genre is because that's basically what what real life is actually like yeah <laughs> yeah. yeah that is finding the um when I was saying, I, I was talking with um, Alex uh, Jane Yule years ago on what this show was, and we were talking about sort of power politics and all that. And I, and I thought, that's going to be, have to be part of it. But then I sort of shrink away because I don't understand what that is, power politics. I'm, I'm not a powerful politician. I don't know what that is. But if you then go, well, actually, most people in charge of anything end up just squabbling like people. And you go, what's the analogy? And it's like, 
you know, I, I've been involved in production teams that got on really well. I've been involved in production teams where we argued all the time. You die for three hours over something where you walked away from it. I've forgotten why on earth we were even talking about that in the first place. And go, that's where the experiences come, and, and you put that into trying to run a republic. And that's, for me, when, you know, the, the teetering of something good or something, well, not even good, something that sort of just about sort of stumbles along vaguely working and then sort of collapses and turns into something truly abhorrent. That's how that happens. It's not, I, I, you know, especially, you know, today in our own country, it's people just trying to keep their jobs and making mistakes and having the wrong, I suppose it's the wrong motivations and the wrong priorities and then sort of just panicking. A lot of it is panicking. And then, you know, uh, what they ought to do is then stop and go, right, we've, we've done the wrong thing. We need to go, go back from this. But actually they don't just go, right, let's just carry on in this direction, hope nobody notices. And that's the, sort of the mark between a good and a bad politician, a good and a bad leader, is that you, you realise you're, you're cocking up and you're going to do, do yeah. something about it. But in this series, um, they, they probably won't. No, absolutely. And, and I think they won't for entirely the wrong reasons. I think culturally, the only answer to that I can think of is to, is to foster an environment where accountability is treated as like a real sort of source of strength you know where people are like yes if you can say i messed up everyone gives you a round of applause you know like but <laughs> I, I don't think that would have helped gaius or mark because mark no. would like to drink pineapple juice with quite a lot of vodka in it by a pool and uh, gaius thinks that he under any circumstances will be better than anyone else under any circumstances yes and I think in Gaius's case, he's sort of right because there is no one else in his world with remotely the same potential and skill set. If this guy had morals, just think what he could achieve. Like, yes. if this guy had any interest in, like, the well-being of the Roman people, just think what his legacy could have been because he was so goddamn powerful. And, and he did it while being you know sort of really cold all the time and wearing three tunics and you know being not super charismatic until he presumably learned a trick for that later on but he just had this genius for administration and a genius for public relations that i think made him just this unbelievably formidable figure yeah well that's the, that's the very much the historical octavian who turns into Augustus. Um, I say in history, he's often treated like two different people. There's young Octavian and then Emperor Augustus, and there's always split in the middle. And of course, throughout this series, actually, I think the position I took from the start is trying to make him a person who genuinely does want to change things. He wants to get something done. He does want to do this, but it's the amount to which... It, it's, it's a character who can't see the wood for the trees and then ends up sort of spiralling into a different direction. And I think he, he would, would stop realising why he's doing this and what it is he's trying to accomplish, and then suddenly power would take over. Throughout this season, I think um, Gaius is, I wouldn't say an innocent character, but he, he is a person muddling along trying to push policies and get actual politics done and be like the adult in the room and is not quite working out. And he's certainly in the very much in the um, the earlier phases of the series. At this point, I think there are sort of dark elements creeping in. And that's the bit that's quite satisfying is the point where you start to introduce those elements after a number of episodes where he's just been, oh, you know, can't we just sit down and have a meeting, Mark? And then later on, especially I think over Grace's episodes going into the finale, the, the darker elements, the slightly more self-serving elements for him and Mark sort of creep in. But it's, it's, it's been fun to try and write a, the younger version of Octavian, um, of, of Augustus, who does appear, in, you know, he appears very briefly in Shakespeare's Julius Caesar, he does appear in programs, he's HBO's Rome and the rest of it, but usually, again, they're in the sort of way that these shows are always people who are conniving and scheming, and I'd say competent, and that's, why I, that's the bit I find very hard to find believable in things like HBO's Rome, lots of shows, is people all seem to be quite competent and are out on, you know, competing each other. And I think, no, I think the majority of people are incompetent. The most yeah. people don't know what they're doing and they're making mistakes. And sometimes those mistakes work out. But that's how I think people are panicking and screwing up and don't really know what they're doing and uh, selfish or idealistic or sometimes genuinely very good at what they're doing and should be there. But that doesn't happen very often. And when you throw those people together and then have a disaster happen or have somebody like Cleopatra who genuinely knows what she's doing and is powerful and is totally clued up just turns up on your doorstep and go oh my god she's so much better than us what do we do that's for me that's something believable like we all have experiences of blagging it we all go into a project going i've no idea why i'm here 
like imposter syndrome is rife, especially in the creative industry. We don't know what we're doing. And I think that's what a lot of the characters in this are. Do you know, that that's something I find quite interesting. I've never really thought about this before, but it does make me feel quite sympathetic towards Mark. <laughs> so Mark is someone who, you know, he was master of the horse for Julius Caesar, and he was, by all accounts, very good at that. He's a very, very good general, right? Yeah. Like, really excellent at military tactics on the field. And suddenly he's promoted out of his ability. Yes. And so this guy who is good at what he does, he's really good. And then he's suddenly given this massive promotion, which he assumes he'll be good at because he's been good at everything else. And he's terrible. He can't do it at all. And he's massively outclassed. And there are two things that you can do in that situation. Number one is you can go back to the books and study and learn and look around you and figure out who you can copy and follow until you can do the job. And number two is you can go and get drunk and (laughs) try not to get caught not knowing what you're doing and try not to get fired or killed. And that's you know, he's very much an option B person. But like, you know, I do think there is something, there is pathos in that. Mm. Yeah. And also the fact that he is therefore kind of on the way down, because he's a lot older as well. Whereas Gaius is quite clearly on the way up and in a much better position. But he doesn't have the kind of status yet. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah I think, it, and Lepidus is just still, <laughs> just going along in the middle. Oh, Lepidus. Just bubbling along. <laughs> he's neither on the way up nor on the way down. Just there. Just there. Yeah, he's involved. just also there. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so, no, so you had another question which we did not get to. So the other question was kind of, did you feel a responsibility towards these characters to not misrepresent them because they were real mm. people? I mean, I'm very aware that like what we know about what they were like is just what was written and so we don't actually know. But I wondered if that troubled you at all or in what way you kept that in mind? I suppose I didn't feel bad for them because I'm fairly sure, you know, I've no idea uh, which um, the descendants of Mark Antony's family are still knocking about somewhere might listen to this and go, <laughs> well, hang on. But I think you need to decide what story you're telling and what roles those characters need to inhabit. It's the same reason that there are some people who would have been around at that time who are not in this show, including family members. Like, we've simplified people's families, so, like, those relatives, those children aren't here because they just get in the way. The phantom character of Cicero, who I think has turned up more often in these behind-the-scenes yes. chats than he, he's <laughs> ever referred to in the show because he doesn't turn up and he's never even referred... I think he's referred to maybe once in the entire I love show. That he keeps coming up in these kind of behind-the-scenes gossipy episodes <laughs> when it seems to yeah. fit what his character is yeah. uh, portrayed to be so well. <laughs> it's sort of, um, you decide what role people want to be. Like, you know, Lepidus is a character I've wanted to write about for a long time. I always had an idea of a dramatic play I wanted to write about him, and I still might at some point. But, you know, in reality, it is unlikely. It's likely he was just, you know, he was a scheming politician who just was outclassed by the mm. people he was working with, and that's why he fell away, like so many other people um, who sort of just fall away from history, as opposed to this sort of bumbling old duffer wandering around. But equally, the latter is, of course, more fun to play with, and also then in- enables you to have many more sort of levels and bits of uh, drama. In terms of Gaius and, and, and Mark and some of the other characters, the, the only concern that I would have is not necessarily misrepresenting them, but misrepresenting sort of, I suppose, the broad sweep of history. People know that this is entertainment, so the only areas where I was sort of slightly more, oh, I, I have to be a bit careful on that, was to do with, though I, I am playing the series into the side of isn't, you know, almost at the thick of it style or yes, minister, silliness of politics can be silly because those people are, you know, foolish and doing these things, is that you are still watching a, a society sleepwalking into a form of imperial fascism, which is a very heavy topic and not one that you want to treat flippantly. And I don't think that, you know, especially with working with the other writers like Grace on this section with Amani as um, showrunner, um, and lots of discussions. I don't think it is flippant. I think we, we, you know, we have done everything quite deliberately. But it still needs to be funny. It still needs to be darkly funny. And I think we do treat the characters seriously throughout this series. I hope. I think, on the whole. <laughs> Yeah, or maybe not Lepidus, but yeah. <laughs> Even he has uh, motivations, who I, I agree with. Like, what does Lepidus want? He wants to have his breakfast. He wants to have a nice walk in the sun. We can get behind that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, he wants something. to have a birthday party. Yes, he wants um, to have a birthday party. <laughs> so I'm almost reluctant. This is some, a conclusion I've been coming to through this chat, actually. Because I guess the question that I've been circling around in my head is, are we at risk of laundering Gaius's reputation, kind of, with this 
yes. podcast. And one, I actually don't think we are because of things that are like sprinkled through, then, th- you know, things that you see him do. But also, I'm coming to the conclusion that actually it doesn't matter because that was in the past. And the relevance of seeing how people could get into situations like this and seeing how, well, as you said, like, it's like the unsexy admin yeah. and the quiet changes and how there are people around the people making those quiet changes, just enabling them or not really stopping them. And that's how we get to these, oh, yeah. often that's how we get to bad situations. And I think that's a good lesson to learn. But I think that's the conclusion I'm coming to. <laughs> yeah, I think there's an extent to which the Romans, and particularly these people at this time, almost belong to literature as much as to history. Mm. Like we know of Julius Caesar, Mark Antony, and to some extent, Octavian, mainly through the works of Shakespeare, of other playwrights, over many, many centuries of various TV series and films. And so there's a great element of drama. There's a certain amount of plundering this for for literature and then seeing what story you want to tell in a way that you would not approach in the same sort of maybe lofty way as you would for particular elements of 20th century uh, history, um, shall we say, where things got very, very dark and you would approach it a different way. This is something which is thousands of years in the past and those people feel very distant. You still want to treat the subject matter seriously, but I think sometimes the way you treat the subject seriously is by sort of being a bit sort of clownish to start with and then as Grace said if if you said this is very serious all the way people don't get on board if you say here's a bunch of quite funny people doing their funny things and then later on you twist the knife in that's when you start to actually I think for me at least connect with that material and also connect with the seriousness of a, of a situation mm. well I've been thinking about this and I think you've both said some very interesting things about the idea of do you have to have any responsibility towards the people, the real people you're representing? And I think my answer is no, because, as you say, David, they're thousands of years old. You can't really hurt the dead. However, I would say we do have a responsibility towards what those people are in the public consciousness. Yes. Yeah. And I also think we have a responsibility towards how those people will be read by modern people, by the yes, actual yeah. audience of this show. And also a responsibility towards the audience. Okay, so the thing is, right, Mark Antony, the man, who who knows? God, it was yeah. hard not to swear in that sentence. Um, <laughs> Thank you. Who knows who that guy was? It doesn't matter. But if you're writing him, you know what he means to your audience, right? Which is, he's the guy that delivered the Friends Romans Countryman speech when um, Caesar died. He's the guy who had perhaps the most famous tragic love affair with Cleopatra. Everyone knows those stories, right? Like, everything that he says in your show will be understood in the context of those facts, because those are universal. Which means every time I was writing an interaction between him and Cleopatra, I'm thinking, these people are not lovers. Absolutely not. I don't think she even particularly likes him. But there's got to be a... (laughs) But there's got to be a frisson. There's got to be something. It has to be readable as... I can sort of see how they might get there because the yeah. audience knows that, right? Similarly, we can write Mark and Fulvia as, as a happy married couple, right? But we have to be aware that this is a relationship that's going to end and I think that will colour, whether you want it to or not, that's going to colour how people read it. So we have to write it in that way. So that's, that's kind of Mark. But when it, comes to, when it comes to Gaius, we who cares about the man? But we are writing what that man represents. And what he represents is the person who destroyed the late Republic. <laughs> right? That's, that's who he is. He is the first emperor of Rome. And even if you don't know really anything about it, I mean, all right, I didn't know that he was Augustus until I Googled it at the start of researching this show. I didn't mm. realise I was the same guy. But once you do, you're like, oh, right, yeah, Augustus. I found Rome clay, I leave it marble. Yeah. That's apparently, I only know that because it was in a sketch show, to be honest. But, like, <laughs> yeah, you yeah. know. Which shows the importance of art in communicating these things. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's culturally, it's massive. So, whoever, whatever we do, we are writing an interpretation of someone who ended democracy, right? Mm. So, that's how it will be read. 
and and of course let's caveat that with what democracy let's caveat that <laughs> with well he didn't do it on his own let's caveat that with you know anything you like but fundamentally the first emperor of rome was augustus that's this guy yeah so that's that's how i feel about the kind of famous characters when it comes to characters like charmian for example who we we know was a historical figure uh, we know she was cleopatra's favorite slave we know she was illiterate and we know we think that she was kept illiterate by Cleopatra because she didn't want to give her too much power, which we can make a lot of inferences about that woman, about how intelligent she must have been, about how Cleopatra must have seen her as a threat as well as a weapon, if that's yeah. what she did. So when it comes to characters who have been lost to history, right, like Mark Antony, even Lepidus, you know, there's plenty of text about them, I'm sure. There's probably loads of first-person quotations, people writing in their letters to Atticus, but writing about, um, you know, what what they were up to, what they did. But Charmian's gone. Yeah. yeah. And so I think our responsibility to her is different. Yes, I, no, that's fair. I think the characters who are gone, who don't have as strong a voice, I think the responsibility is, I suppose, to try to make them as engaging a character as you can and make them people that um, the audience will start to think about and ask questions of and go and do research yeah. and in many cases discover, sadly, there isn't much there. So thank you so much both for joining me. Listeners, thank you for joining us. I hope you enjoyed this and I hope you're enjoying the show again, powering towards the end. Yeah, so do stick around and I'll see you next time. And shall we all say goodbye? Goodbye! Bye. Backstage at Cry Havoc is a podcast distributed by Rusty Quill and licensed under a Creative Commons Attribution non commercial share alike 4.0 international license. It is directed by Armani Zardo, produced by Laurie Ann Davis, with executive producers Alexander J. Newell and April Sumner. This episode was edited by Laurie Ann Davis and Catherine Vanella. Thanks for listening. <laughs> <laughs>